the uh, mental health series for this year. And today we'll be talking about perfectionism. But before jumping in, I, I wanna just take a second to acknowledge the um, loss of life in Turkey and Syria last night. Um, that on top of just lots of tragedy, tragedies that we've been, um, that have happened around us and have been certainly happening in Ukraine for over the, the last year. Uh, so before jumping in, I wanna do a quick exercise with everyone. Uh, this is a containment exercise uh, that helps us really stay present in the moment. I think there's a lot that's happening around us. That's typical on any, any day for most of us, we serve in many roles. Uh, uh, with high stakes. And so being able to be present and engaged, you're taking the hour to be here. So let's get the most out of it. So when you're ready, I would like you just to take a deep breath in through your nose and release through your mouth. And now if you could scan <clears throat> In the next breath in, scan your body from your head to your toe, head to your toes, and just note where you may be holding some stress or tension, maybe some worries or things on your to-do list that you know you need to get to later today. And just take note of those, or, or maybe you're holding that in your body. And set that aside for a second. And now I want you to imagine, bring to mind a container. It can be any shape or any size. The only rule is it has to have a lid. And I'd like you now to come back to your body. Wherever you notice that tension, that stress, the mounting to-dos, maybe the heaviness of the, the loss of life that's either touched you directly or indirectly. Imagine those worries or those stressors kind of being put into that container. Not with the intent to push it away or ignore it or become numb to it, but rather to purposely kind of put it in a safe space where it can sit while you're engaged with the present moment so you can get the most out of this hour. That might take a few breaths in and out to imagine kind of putting that stressor away. When you're ready, you can close the container and find a spot maybe on a shelf next to you in a bag with a friend, put it somewhere where it can just sit. And again, this isn't for to, to push it out or push it away, but rather to have it, give it a place um, to safely sit while you engage in the moment. And then when you're ready, and when the time calls for it, you can come back and pull out what maybe is, is sitting in, in your container when you have the time, the resources, or, or the support. I think this is an important skill to, um, it's a really easy one and practical one to pull on. Because when we have mounting stressors happening around us, um, we tend to push through, kind of maybe push them aside. We become numb to the tragedies that really can that are happening around us as a way to push through. Our bodies are, and minds are really creative, find creative ways to survive. But that makes us vulnerable to dehumanizing one another. And the reality is that um, as Bessel van der Kolk so perfectly put it, a trauma researcher, our body often remembers what our mind forgets. And so I think um, these traumas that are happening around us do often leave a footprint on our physiology and show up in, in later ways if we aren't willing to address it. But for now, we are here, we're talking about perfectionism and its impact on our mental health. I appreciate your presence. We're gonna um, quickly, we'll define perfectionism, identify the pathways that, that lead us to perfectionism, and then talk, spend a big chunk of our time um, talking about the alternative to perfectionism. So if we know that this is making us vulnerable to um, mental health issues like anxiety and depression, then being able to pull on new skills 
uh, that activate healthy striving so that we can thrive in our work and in our personal life. And then I just, I do wanna uh, encourage you to stay for the breakout sessions. This is where we really digest the information and unpack uh, uh, how it's relevant to us personally. For many of us, perfectionism is a part of our identity. It's something that we hold onto and we hold on to proudly because our culture tends to really praise us for being perfectionists. And, and here, uh, I'm not asking you necessarily, necessarily to let go of it. Ultimately, that's your choice. I'm sorry about that. But um, wanting you to think about taking an alternative path for the sake of your own mental health. So we often conflate the desire to excel with the desire to be perfect and they are not at all the same. So I think it's important to, to define perfectionism here. Um, it's really the tendency to demand uh, of ourselves an extremely high or flawless level of performance. Uh, and it's associated with depression and anxiety and eating disorders as well as other mental health outcomes or problems. Whereas excelling is the desire to succeed and enjoyment in the process uh, connected to a goal that's meaningful and specific. Uh, perfectionism is often driven by fear and the desire to fulfill expectations of others. Um, and it's a disorder. It's not a disorder, but it makes us uh, vulnerable to disorders like anxiety and depression. So Dr. Hewitt, a psychology researcher at the University of British Columbia and his colleagues define perfectionism as being multidimensional. Um, through, they, they talk about self-oriented perfectionism, socially prescribed perfectionism, and other-oriented perfectionism. So folks who are self-oriented perfectionists have a hyper in, internal focus on being perfect. Uh, the research, or, our research really says that those uh, who are socially or self-oriented perfectionists tend to do fairly well in day-to-day -day life. They are less vulnerable to mental health problems but become more vulnerable as stakes increase, as stressors mount, which is inevitable for all of us. Socially prescribed perfectionists are hyper-focused on the way others may harshly evaluate ourselves. The, the kind of upkeep is ongoing and, and really never ending. And this has the largest association with mental health concerns. If you haven't already, I'd encourage you to go back to last year's talks on anxiety and depression. It might be helpful and relevant here. And then other oriented perfectionism is when we have harsh or unrealistic judgments of others. We've all been in uh, work situations where we have been on the receiving end of someone's perfectionist and that makes it incredibly difficult to thrive and, and optimize our work. It's not uncommon for us to hold uh, or, or kind of play out many of these dimensions or multiple and not just one. So when I'm working with, with folks as a well-being advisor here at OITE, um, people often ask like, how, where does this come from, right? I've been perfectionist my whole life. How did, how did this happen? If it's so, so hurtful, um, why does it sustain? And there are lots of different ways um, uh, that we take on perfectionism. The first that I'll talk about is we learn perfectionism. It's a safety response often to unresolved traumas or difficult experiences. It's a way that we protect ourselves from being rejected or being turned away. If we don't feel like we belong, we're gonna show up perfectly so we can't um, have any opportunity of being seen as not good enough. Perfectionism is reinforced. We're rewarded for our behaviors. This is especially true in the biomedical research field where right, overworking long hours is deemed as kind of a badge of honor. Uh, we get praise from our mentors, from PIs yeah, about this. And then there's observational learning. We watch the people that we care about, that we admire in the field, playing out these behaviors and seeing them get rewarded for it. And so we then internalize this message that what we produce and what we achieve uh, determines our worth, not that we are inherently worthy as humans. So we're treated often as tools of production or can be in this field. Uh, and, and so we, we take on these patterns to survive. And then there's instructional learning. So we receive messages, both explicit, but more often than not implicit messages from our parents, from families, colleagues, mentors about the value of being a perfectionist. 
Then the next pathway that we'll talk about is, is uh, stress. So things like discrimination, systemic racism, and stereotype threat um, all are high stress issues that make us vulnerable or, or kind of prime us to pull on to our perfectionism as a way to protect us against these harmful impacts. Claude Steele, the, the researcher who discovered stereotype threat often uses the phrase, we over efforting, right? We overwork to counter uh, our stereotypes. Work or relationship stressors can make us vulnerable or prime, a, prime the pathway for perfectionism because we don't want to be rejected. We don't want to be disconnected in these really meaningful places. Lack of skills. Uh, to effectively regulate normal but very difficult emotions like anxiety or fear, and then high stakes situations that are connected to meaningful parts of our identity. So that, that's often work related, right? When we're going to give a job talk, when we're going to show up in a lab meeting and present our work, um, those can be prime pathways for our perfectionism to kick in. And then the last that we'll spend time here thinking about are, are cognitive models, which are just the ways that we view ourselves in relation to the world. And so with perfectionism, many of us create these rigid rules about how we need to operate in the world. Um, these beliefs are rooted in, in distortions and a fixed mindset and, and help, they put us on high alert for things that could be a threat to our well-being. Part of these cognitive models are um, rooted in, in limiting self-beliefs that we, we need perfectionism to, to survive, to adapt, to actually thrive in our work. And we'll talk about those myths in a little bit. So some thoughts that fuel our perfectionism, uh, these are called distortions. We all have them, uh, but we become more prone to them in high stress situations and certainly more prone when we are not aware of them. So just having awareness, if any of these resonate with you, um, just note them, right? Don't judge yourself. Again, we all have them. It's recognizing which are the ones that help that pull you deeper into your perfectionism. Discounting the positive and minimizing is a huge one. We often, whenever as perfectionists, we do achieve a goal or uh, we achieve this impossible standard, we reappraise the standard as actually not being good enough or we give credit elsewhere. We tend to um, be hyper-focused on the critical feedback or see only the negative, right? That's where our negativity bias jumps in. We ruminate, which is not kind of purposeful reflection where we can pull in helpful information to learn for next time. It's rather staying stuck in the past and replaying what didn't work, what all the things we didn't, vote, didn't do well. Reinforcing the sense that we have to be perfect in order to be um, seen as worthwhile or qualified. Fixed mindset, right? Just this idea that we have to have it all figured out right now um, or, or we can't do it. Uh, we don't belong. Harsh, overly critical self-talk. The, the reality is we all have an inner, internal chatter and sometimes that's negative and that negative self-talk can be helpful fuel. But when that is loud and persistent and rooted in these distortions, that's when it becomes harmful and really contributes or makes us vulnerable to heightened anxiety um, or depression. We tend to catastrophize or overgeneralize, and we'll talk about these, this framework of seeing um, setbacks as pervasive, per personal, and permanent, and how to counter that. We see things in a black and white or all or nothing framework, and then fortune telling and mind reading, you know, cousins of one another, essentially try predicting the future when we know we can't. So, we, we anticipate an outcome and it's usually through a negative light where we, we mind read, we assume people are evaluating us negatively. And our perfectionism shows up to forget, protect against all of these. In perfectionism, we often, <clears throat> we often um, offer the label to people who uh, are successful or have all these accolades, but the reality is so many perfectionists suffer so internally um, without sharing that with anyone. People do not realize how much time and energy and worry is spent on pursuing perfectionism. And so that can play out in our behaviors. It can look like overworking and over planning, just starting things over and over. It's an incredible um, 
cost and our time. And as a result, there can we, we can sacrifice pretty important parts of ourselves. Um, so our relationships take a hit or if we're all day invested in, in doing things perfectly at work, our self-care, certainly our sleep. There's com uh, persistent comparison to others. We'll talk about some skills around how to counter that because comparison will inevitably show up. We procrastinate, so we don't talk about this a lot in perfectionism, again, because we only see the outcome, which is often, um, right, we, we only want to show our best. And so we don't let people in on how long we've been procrastinating or pushing off. And as a result, we might be hide or we lie. Um, we might just fully abstain from taking any risks or saying yes to things that could flex some new muscles or challenge us at, at work. And as a result of all this, this, really, we often kind of swing back and forth from this overworking to procrastinating. And really what that does is it creates an exhaustive state that our body simply cannot sustain um, and can lead up to burnout, make us vulnerable to numbing and avoiding behaviors, which we will talk about in the unit next month. So please join us for that. And then common emotional responses to perfectionism, right? We all, anyone who's ever struggled with perfectionism knows the intense internal anxiety that comes before the high stakes situation that really triggers your perfectionism, right? You feel anxious, you feel worried, uh, potentially afraid. So your, your sympathetic nervous system, the part of your physiology that um, detects threat is, right? It's, it's hijacked, it's on high alert. And so you feel dysregulated, you maybe feel tension in your stomach, some panic, um, defensiveness, possibly if you're on, you really want to protect against feedback, especially. An interesting emotion that's that's commonly shown around perfectionism is this sense as pride, right? We we hold it with the, um we hold this title tightly because it is so rewarded and affirmed in our culture. And what happens as a result of these thoughts and these behaviors and emotions playing out is we create this really insidious feedback loop. It's hard, uh, hard to escape. And it starts with this basic limiting self-belief that our self-worth is dependent on achievement. That uh, triggers these, these distortions that we talked about, the cognitive biases, and then our perfectionistic behaviors and, and emotions. So that overworking, overplanning, procrastination, unregulated anxiety and fear about how we're gonna perform. And that leads typically to three different outcomes. The first being, right, we, we temper it, we figure out a way to actually succeed or we meet the standards. Right, and that's the one we often see on the outset that we often attribute to perfectionists. That's why we hold to the myth that we have to be perfect to be successful. Um, and what this does, as a result, when we when we meet the standards as perfectionists, what we often do then is is fall into the distortion of reappraising the standards as as insufficiently demanding. So we minimize, and it reinforces this. Um, the sense that we have to continue, we have to keep this up. We have to continue to prove our self-worth by continuing to achieve. And so we're on this never-ending treadmill that's exhausting and scary and overwhelming. And essentially, and at some point, right, we will fail to meet standards. We will, we won't always be perfect. That's inevitable. We're gonna failure is something we all will navigate. And so that is another outcome that with perfectionists tends to lead to counterproductive behaviors like avoidance or numbing, isolation. We have, we often feel intense feelings of shame or fear. And so one way that we alleviate that is just again, going back to this belief that, okay, we have to achieve to prove our self-worth, to feel better, to, to move away from these uncomfortable emotions. And then the last outcome that's not talked about often and, often and not seen because perfectionists tend to not let people in and how much they're struggling is that uh, they avoid trying to meet standards. So they don't take the risk. They don't really optimize their potential 
they don't ask that question in a lab meeting. That paper is never written. That idea is never shared um, because they're they're afraid of the feedback. They're afraid of potential fail, failure, and that also then leads to um, kind of fuels this pattern that's that's never ending. <clears throat> But despite these costs and despite this exhausting cycle that we can stay on, um, per perfectionism stays alive, right? It, it persists in our life because it protects us in the immediate from <clears throat> judgment, from opportunities of rejection, um, from the discomfort of uncertainty, certainly from, from failures. So if we don't take the risk, then we can't fail. If we don't try something new, if we don't ask that question in lab, if we don't seek the feedback from our PI, right, we won't get that information or, or have that opportunity to, to learn and grow. It protects us from letting others down or ourselves, really facing fears of where we might not be good enough. The reality is that we don't have it all. We don't all have it all together. We don't all know everything, right? There's going to be areas of growth. Um, and so sometimes it's harder to face that reality and to fig, being willing to, to sit with that discomfort a bit. But the reality is that despite all these things that protects us from, and this list certainly isn't exhaustive, those, that protection is short-lived. And it really what it does is it contributes to our internal distress um, in the long run. And it makes us more vulnerable to mental health challenges. It isolates us. We know that the, the research really says right, perfectionism hinders our, is a barrier to our success for all the reasons I've already talked about, right? We, we, don't, um, we don't step up when we can at work. We, we back away from opportunities. We procrastinate or overwork, which um, leads to more cognitive errors, leads to burnout, right? It makes us vulnerable to some of those things that impacts our productivity ultimately in the long run and it minimizes our opportunities to seek and receive feedback, right? So we, that's the very thing we avoid. It's a barrier to our well-being. We talked about why this is not what the team plays out. On the steering wheel. Where? On the steering wheel. Oh, here it is, here it is. Our resilience. Uh, uh, Dr. Milgram often talks about resilience takes people, a process and preparation. And the reality is perfectionism breeds scarcity in all realms. Right? We go at it alone as perfectionists. We don't want to let anyone in on our struggle. We want them only to see the perfect outcome. And so we are solo in this process as we overwork or procrastinate or overplan or avoid, right? We become really static and stifled in that. And so it makes us, um, it makes us quite fragile actually, it's the opposite of resilient. But we hold on to these, we cling to our perfectionism because we tell ourselves these stories that it's gotten us to where we are. I hear that all the time. Um, or that uh, without it, people will know I don't actually belong, which is at the core of imposter fears. And people, I hear people say all the time that I won't be taken serious in my work or in my lab if I don't do and say everything perfectly. And we're not sure that we can manage mistakes or bounce back from the inevitable failure. So right again, perfectionism um, protects us from even taking those risks where we may fail. And frankly, right, it's this badge of honor. We like to call ourselves perfectionists. It's part of our titles, part of our identities. And so for me to sit here and ask you today to let go of some of that is, is kind of a big ask. We know that um, in behavior change research, where we kind of go through these six phases. The first is, is pre-contemplation, where you, um, you know, anyone who's in pre-contemplation is probably not here. That's where you don't think you have a problem. Perfectionist isn't cause, causing any issues in your life. Um, but then we move into contemplation, where we realize there are some costs that we're experiencing. We're not sure if we're quite ready to let go. Most people who are perfectionists live in this space for a really, really long time because we're afraid to let go of this part of our identity. But then when we're ready to move into preparation, we do things like show up to these talks, we do acquire new skills, we think about how this could look differently for me, how my time could be better spent, how I could be more productive ultimately. 
if I engaged purposefully with my work and not from a place of fear. And then we move into action, which is where we're gonna go next is what it means to kind of take on healthy striving skills. Um, and then ultimately into maintenance where perfectionistic tendencies are a thing of the past. Maybe some things that come, might bump it, uh, show up in moments of high stress again, but you quickly can pull into the skills and the patterns of healthy striving that we um, know serve us. So we cling to perfectionist, perfectionism and that, that part of our identity until we really know what the alternative, alternatives are. And, and the alternatives are healthy striving or excellent striving. The research uses these terms kind of interchangeably. So I put them both in here and I'll use them interchangeably, but I ultimately want you to think what, which one resonates with you or even find your own label um, because it is part of your identity that hopefully you can take on and, and soak in. And so what is it? Healthy striving is about setting high standards still. So you're not letting go of expectations, um, but the standards are realistic, they're measurable, um, and you, you know that setbacks and failure is going to happen and, and you still will navigate them. You focus on the process, so your locus of control rather than uh, just the outcome, which uh, is, is often impacted by many variables. Healthy striving improves confidence and self-efficacy through managing our distortions, which we'll talk about how to do that practically, setting realistic expectations, seeking support and feedback along the way, so not going at it alone. Again, a, a component of truly being resilient. And then managing the difficult emotions that come with doing hard work that you all do, um, with uh, managing the multiple roles that you play in your life. And then incre increasing compassion for yourself. Compassion is not the same as pity. It's not feeling sorry for things being hard, uh, but it's about uh, showing up for yourself in a, a kind and purposeful way, which is uh, quite the opposite of perfectionistic tendencies. And so here I know just some of the benefits of, of healthy striving, right? We, we still care about productivity, like I talked about. Um, but our, our self-worth is detached from the outcome. Ironically, right, this ultimately helps us probably be more productive in the end because uh, we can remain engaged and connected to our work for longer bouts of time because we're connected to the process. We reduce unproductive planning and disorganization, which minimizes our risk or vulnerability for things like burnout. Uh, we seek support when needed. We take calculated risks. So we ask that question in Lab &E, we write that paper, we, um, we bring the new ideas, we show up and give a job talk. We do what is, is our physicians call for and we do them well still. So. so how do we cultivate it? We're gonna talk about a number of skills today, but the first and probably most important is increased self-awareness. So if you're one of those folks who's in the contemplation stage, that's good and okay. Um, and I would say stay there for a little bit and, and one way to move through that and understand, do you wanna do this whole healthy striving thing is to sit with some of the prompts that are at the end of the slide deck. You'll get, you'll get uh, the slides in a day or two from now. Um, so sit with those, explore what are the, when does perfectionism show up for you and what ultimately is it protecting you from? What are the costs of letting go of it? What are the costs that it's, it's um, causing in your life now. Uh, you cultivate healthy striving by developing a growth mindset. I'm not gonna spend any time on that today because we're doing a supplemental session, uh, February 16th at noon, a fully on growth mindset. So please join when you can. And then we do this by managing our distortions, regulating our emotions and developing uh, self-compassion as well as setting realistic goals and, and managing our time well. One thing we won't spend enough time on today, but I, I do wanna note before moving forward is uh, also simply taking care of the basics. So connecting with other people and other roles in our life, not just our identity at work or our perfectionism, maybe showing up strongly, moving our bodies, nourishing our bodies, getting adequate rest. This is all really important to um, 
cultivating healthy striving and ultimately doing good work over the long haul, so, uh, right? In order to do well, we have to be well. So that means focusing on caring, caring for ourselves. So these are the strategies we'll cover today. We'll talk about cognitive strategies, emotional regulation, and then end on behavior strategies. I'll move through these pretty quickly here. So the first, uh, Cognitive strategies meant to help interrupt those distortions, that all or nothing thinking, the mind reading that's so pervasive and perfectionistic tendencies is first the ABCDE framework. This is from rational emotive therapy. Um, and it's, it's about uh, recognizing the activating events or the situations that trigger your perfectionism. And so when those show up, just noting, noting those as those, those are the anxiety provoking events, right? Where you want to protect and what are those beliefs that show up in those moments? I encourage you, if this is new, it, um, new to you, is think about um, think about writing this down, right? So uh, this is this is a really intentional skill that takes some time, but it, uh, you're able to to pull on it much quicker after some practice. So what are the beliefs, the automatic thoughts that come in those times of high stress that that really are driving your perfectionism. And then I ask, what are the consequences of following these as if they're true? So that's what we do. We have to take those first thoughts and follow them, right? So we, have, we, we follow the mind reading as if it's true. And then as the important kind of next step here is disputing it, learn to create a, a alternative hypotheses or predictions about this, this activating event. How can you interpret the situation differently? And then examine the evidence for or against your original belief versus your new hypothesis. And again, this is where writing it out can be really powerful, at least in the beginning. So it takes some practice and intention. Then the next, uh, the next cognitive strategy is um, interrupting your distortions with hats. This is developed by Dr. Milgram, uh, but it's a simple and, and uh, helpful acronym to remember just to hear your unhelpful and harsh self-talk. Sometimes we are almost immune to it or uh, don't realize how harsh it is because it's something that just has been so pervasive in our life. So when we can learn to really notice it and appreciate that in those moments, we have a choice to either follow that and listen to it or not. We can, be, we can begin to interrupt it and talk back to it with more realistic, truthful and helpful thoughts. Um, and then being willing to seek support in this process. Again, those, those distortions can really be fuel to the fire and difficult to step out of if we aren't being uh, deliberate and interrupting them. And then uh, a final kind of cognitive strategy around our, our specific distortions is learning to reframe um, our, our original thoughts or interpretation. And so learning, pulling on questions that are helpful like what are the facts and data that I have to support this belief? So really backing that up. Um, when I'm not feeling this way, or I'm not in this high stakes situation, does this sort of situation look different for me? Oh, how, how would I think differently? I often encourage like if you get lost or overwhelmed in some of these questions is just simply ask, if my friend came to me and said this out loud, what, what, how would I respond to them? What would I tell them? can be a helpful way to start with reframing. And then the final two cognitive strategies that I'll touch on today are learning to help uh, adopt a helpful perspective. And uh, the founder of positive psychology, Marty Sullivan, um, really talks about the three Ps of, of an unhelpful mindset in stressful situations or setbacks when we are navigating failure if we see that failure through a permanent, pervasive, and personal lens, we are more prone to fall into those perfectionistic tendencies. We're more prone to ruminate and worry and stay stuck in them, all of which uh, contributes to really um, our, the detriment of our mental health. And so when we're seeing the setback as something that's going to last forever, impact our career forever, right, um, and it's all of our fault then that makes us incredibly vulnerable. So instead, switching the permanent, pervasive, and personal to how, how can we make this impermanent, 
as specific as possible and impersonal. So seeing this point of failure as a simple point in time contained to this skill that you can practice and improve on um, and this outcome that's impacted by many factors, some of which is out of your control. So that's not displacing blame completely, right? It's seeing where you can have impact next time, but learning to adopt a more helpful perspective. And then the final one here is uh, self-affirmation theory by uh, Claude Steele talks about this really affirming other parts of our identity and that requires us being invested in other parts of our identity. When we are, when we have high stakes situations that trigger our perfectionism to turn on, so we're giving an important talk, we're presenting our work, we're publishing a paper, um, it's helpful to navigate the discomfort or the anxiety that we might feel in those moments by, um, by affirming other parts of our identity that signal to us we are more than just our work, we are more than just the outcome of this particular presentation. Uh, right? Many of us here are parents, we are partners, uh, we certainly are friends, we're colleagues, right? So we have more value than just the, the outcome of what we produce. And so now I'll move on to emotional strategies. I'm moving through these pretty quickly, but again, you will have the slides. Um, so you can fall back on these. With emotions, the goal is not to avoid or get rid of them, um, but learn to, to tolerate them so you can act purposely, act in a way that aligns with your goals, both in the media and the long term. And so perfectionism, uh, uh, interrupting perfectionism is really about managing the discomfort of the here and now. So not falling into the reactive mode uh, to push away their anxiety or respond to our fear. And, and so that takes some practice and is, is hard at first. But one really easy skill to, that you can pull on at any moment in the day, you can do in your head, is first to recognize a name. Um, th this, or first this skill is from um, MBSR, Mindful-Based Stress Reduction. And so the R of it is recognize a name, what emotions are coming up for you. So when we notice and accurately name our emotional experience, it doesn't make the emotions bigger, doesn't make us more prone to being overwhelmed by them. In fact, by them. In fact it's, it's quite the opposite. We are able to respond to them purposefully or we, we feel more equipped to readily handle them. The A of this is accept what is here is here. Many of us um, increase our suffering, our distress, because we judge ourselves for feeling anxious leading up to an important meeting or talk or, um, or stressful situation. When in reality, right, just recognizing that, all right, I'm noticing some tension in my body, I'm noticing anxiety, I'm noticing fear, is a signal to, to activate your parasympathetic nervous system, the part of your ner nervous system that helps downregulate calm so you can be engaged and present in whatever ac action you need to do next. The eye of this is investigate. So our emotions are just sources of information, nothing more and nothing less. We don't always have to act on them, but we can take them in as information to help us better understand what we want to do with them. So just simply asking, what is this trying to signal to me? With perfectionism, it's usually something along the lines of this is really important to me. I want to show up here because I care about this work. I want to do this well because I care about this relationship. Um, and so I'm, you know, at the core, that is not a bad thing. And that's an important thing to be aware of. Um, and, and so our, our emotions are just simply trying to signal that to us, even if it's highly uncomfortable. Non-identify is is simply cognitive diffusion. So distancing ourselves from the emotion, seeing it for what it is as a piece of information, piece of data in the bigger picture. Um, and, and so we're not overwhelmed by that. And then the final end is, is asking, now what? Given this information, how do I wanna proceed in a way that aligns with my goals and values both in the immediate and the long run? Some other practical emotional regulation tools to help you be with the discomfort of many of our emotions we feel around perfectionism is the simple mindfulness tool of stop 
and just stop, take a deep breath. So again, this is how we, through deep breathing, so four, seven, eight breathing exercises, square breathing, we activate the parasympathetic nervous system quicker. Take a deep breath or two, and then observe without judgment what's happening inward. So that's interoception. What are the sensations that you're noticing in your body? What are you feeling? And notice what's happening outward. That's exteroception without judgment. Just label it as is. If you are prone to anxiety and getting kind of flooded by the anxiety, I would encourage you to start with exteroception. So uh, looking outward, noticing outward. Um, sometimes it can be difficult at first to do that um, inward reflection or in inward observing. So noticing outside, right? So I'm noticing this table in front of me, this pen in my hand. Um, it just brings you back to the present moment and is another way to regulate your, your nervous system. And then the, the last two P's are just, what's your purpose in this context? What do you need to show up to present, to engage, to be present, and then proceed effectively? So it helps you move through the discomfort and still engage with the present moment. And then sift and soothe is a skill by Dan Siegel, a uh, really simple one of just uh, in times of distress or, or um, uh, discomfort, it's noticing the sensations, the images, the feelings and thoughts with that discomfort. Again, these things do not make the situation or feeling bigger. It actually tends to minimize it or gives us a sense of agency over it. So note it, sift through the, the experience and then soothe yourself with deliberate self-care. That could sim simply be some of those breathing exercises I've already noted moving your body by going on a walk, maybe calling a friend or a colleague um, or journaling. And then I just wanna take a, a second before moving on to the behavior strategies where we'll end is to, to um, talk about some of the most difficult emotions that show up um, uh, around our perfectionism or that our perfectionism helps protect us from and and the first is shame, so this is really about a, a deep seated feeling that we are there's something wrong with us that we are flawed and then and therefore unworthy of acceptance and belonging. This can show up in in um, moments of relational disconnection where that's potentially threatened. So moments of feedback um, are and we often hide from our shame or we push it away or we pretend it's not there, but we know that the best antidote to shame is to talk about it, to acknowledge it, to bring it to the light. And so being willing to share that you are having those feelings or those experiences with someone you trust, maybe it's your mentor, but maybe it's a colleague or a friend or even a therapist, being able to share that internal dialogue that's feeling your shame helps really uh, take away its power and makes us less vulnerable to falling then and or needing perfectionism to, to protect us from, from its experience. And then fear, um, often in stressful situations, we, we subconsciously ask ourselves some series of questions that goes like, do I have what it takes to navigate this? Do I have the skills that I take to navigate the situation? And if we uh, don't think we do, we code that stressor as a threat. Right? And that initiates safety behaviors, which are things like procrastination or overworking. Right? And when we engage in those, that just increases our anxiety because we, we have this fundamental belief that I can't handle it. Right? And that's part of that insidious feedback loop of perfectionism. But when fear sets in and we feel overwhelmed or we feel that discomfort, learning to reappraise that as, as a stressor to navigate not a threat to protect against can really help us turn down the perfectionistic mode that we can get into, right? This is uncomfortable and this is hard and even scary, but I have the skills um, or I can acquire the skills to navigate this. And then anxiety, a, a really uncomfortable one that we want to move away from or push down um, is, is a helpful one to just notice in our bodies so that we can respond to it purposefully instead of withdraw or pull away or procrastinate, the, um, which is our tendency. So challenge the thoughts that are fueling your anxiety using those cognitive strategies we've already talked about. 
and then considering op opposite action, which we'll talk about next in the behavior strategies. So deliberate exposure to the very experience perfectionism is protecting you from is probably the most practical and immediate way you can really start to counter your, your perfectionistic tendencies. And so this might be seeking feedback regularly when you're a person usually that tries to kind of go at it alone and figure it all out so you have the end product. Committing to a time limit on a task and really sticking with it. This might sound really simple, but you'd be amazed on, on how many times I ask folks to do this and the discomfort that it brings to them. Taking calculated risks that works so trying something new, even if you don't feel fully capable. Um, asking a question when you otherwise would stay quiet. So this is deliberate exposure to the thing perfectionism is protecting you from, and that's going to be really individualized. Acting from a place of compassion. Um, so this is one way to do this is to help formulate compassionate self-beliefs, right? So I can handle things when they don't work out. I am valuable even if I make a mistake. Really finding ones that resonate for you. And so if we have time, I'm going to come back to a self-compassion pause exercise, but I want to get through the rest of these behavior strategies. Um, and so the next one is setting realistic goals. We, know, we all know how to do this. We all know SMART goals, but we often uh, lose sight of them, focus only on the outcome as opposed to all the steps needed to take to get to the desired outcome. Um, and we, we lack effective time management skills either because we let the, the impulse of overworking, right, the anxiety of that to take over, procrastination, or we simply don't have the tools. And so I've listed a few easy ones to, to pull on. Um, the first is just to the extent that you have some agency over your schedule, consider when you're most effective in your time and align that with past difficulty. So when you're most effective, think about the, the your more ch cognitively challenging or tasking tasks and chunk that together. We don't all have that luxury and uh, we have differing demands, so that's not always relevant. Pleasure bundling, right? Doing the tasks that you procrastinate with and pairing it with something that you love and enjoy. So I, you know, writing the paper and having your favorite cup of coffee. You don't have that cup of coffee at any other time in the day or week, only when you're writing. Creating rewards or finding a, a starting ritual routine can help uh, um, initiate action. Motivation follows action, not the other way around. So those starting routines can really be helpful. Creating accountability with others that naturally helps be, feel, uh, build in feedback and support, things that perfectionism pulls us away from. And then identify um, progress deadlines, so not waiting. So again, focusing on the, the process where you have a locus of control, where you can have impact and not just the outcome, which helps break things up into to smaller chunks, not seeing it as a, as a total sum, which can be overwhelming. Consider the two-day rule. This can minimize the buildup effect of procrastination. Some of us we, we all are going to misstep and, and fall, fall back into all pa old patterns, but the reality is, um, you know, each day we can uh, make a new choice, make a deliberate action. Considering the impact of the empathy gap, and this is just really about, we're, we're poor predictors of how we're actually going to feel in the moment. We can make all these grand plans about what we're going to do better next time. But the reality is that doesn't often account for our emotional experience that impacts how we feel, how we behave in the moment. So considering those emotional regulation skills and those cognitive restructuring skills and how they'll help you make um, practical and, and helpful plans. And the reality is sometimes we are going to overwork. We're going to deliberately decide to overwork or procrastinate because the um, the immediacy of the task calls for it, the importance of it calls for it. Um, and so choosing those, choosing those behaviors deliberately is different than letting perfectionism, the pattern, that, that feedback loop of your worth being driven by this outcome um, and, and fueling your perfectionism is really different, right? But whatever decision you make, it will come with a cost. No decisions are, um, without risk or without cost. And so making those 
really purposefully is important and, and then coping with those costs. And then the final strategies I'll share with you here are helpful comparisons. So we as humans will forever compare, right? Anyone who gives you the advice to stop comparing is giving you bad advice because you are going to do it. Uh, our uh, negativity bias really kicks in. Uh, we're prone to focus solely on our deficiencies uh, in perfectionism. And we, we often see other people through this lens of having it all together and uh, as if they are perfect, right? And, and so that can fuel some of these, uh, these feelings of shame and like we don't belong. But instead of comparing from a lens of deficiency, a helpful way to think about this is to ask, what is that person doing that I admire and appreciate? So really labeling, what is it that you're seeing that you appreciate? And then operationalizing that. So what are the skills or supports or knowledges? Like what, what can I do to acquire um, this skill that this person has, right? And another way to think about comparison is learning to do it with yourselves. So intercomparison, we often are comparing out or comparing ourselves outward, um, but learning to do so inward is a helpful way of also receiving feedback. So how thinking about how you've progressed in a certain skill um, or technique or task over a specific amount of time and making this as specific and measurable as possible or specific as possible. And then the final one is person. I, I like to end on this because it's it's a more of a fun one. Is personify your perfectionism. This is an externalization skill we use in therapy, uh, and it it's it, learn give yourself give your perfectionistic identity, so your perfectionistic self, a name. And what this does is it helps you distance from this part of you that feels all encompassing and and feels necessary for you to take on to navigate tasks well when the reality is, right, I've provided the evidence, we don't need it actually is a detriment to us. But when we can externalize this part of us and see it as something outside of us, it makes it a bit easier to really pull in these strategies that I've shared with you today and um, see ourselves as um, not someone that needs our perfectionism to strive and to thrive ultimately. All right, so we're at time. I won't be able to do the self-compassion pause with you, but you will have the slides and want you to think about it. Um, it's really grounded in this per perspective that when we are overwhelmed or we're caught in the pattern of overworking is taking a moment to pause, offer ourselves some encouragement, and then giving ourselves deliberate feedback about what to do next. So coming from a place of compassion means offering that kindness, that awareness, so that's the mindfulness. You're not the only one that's navigating that. That's the common humanity of perfectionism. And then the added layer of really productive feedback, which is what do I want to do with this? Compassion is meaningless if there is an action behind it. And so that, that compassion pause is really about um, making a deliberate choice to, to pull on some of these healthy striving strategies. All right. So I'll give a few minutes um, for questions, if there are any. I'm seeing a few in the chat. Um, please hang around for the discussion groups if you are able. And then next month, we're going to uh, be covering avoiding and numbing behaviors. April will be suicide awareness. And then we'll be doing a wrap up in May. And then there's some resources here at the end. And as I noted at the beginning of the talk, if you're one of those folks who are still kind of contemplating what, you know, do I want to let go of this part of myself, do something different, you're, that's normal and that's okay, I encourage you to spend some time here with these prompts.